Thank you, David, for those generous words, and thank you for um, inviting me to speak here today. It's an absolute pleasure. So to begin, when we're talking about the left ventricle, it's important to consider the anatomical position. So the RV is the most anterior structure when the heart's in the chest, and the left atrium is the most posterior structure. It's a true posterior structure. So the left ventricle is really lateral, posto inferior. And so if we vary the anatomical position, and in this heart, we've actually just turned it to the right so that you can see the interventricular groove, the anterior interventricular groove dividing the right ventricle from the left ventricle with your left anterior descending artery and your, uh, the great coronary vein running through that groove. You can then see that the left ventricle becomes more prominent. So it's really lateral and, of course, to the left of the right ventricle, but it's also posto inferior. And if you turn the heart in that direction, then you'll see a bit more of the left atrium and you'll see the left atrial appendage, which is really the only part of the left atrium that protrudes forward. And I draw your attention to how the pulmonary trunk is anterior uh, to the aortic root and ascending aorta, and that, that really lies to the right of it, which we'll come to later. So how did we get there? How did we get to that anatomical position? Well, just like our GI tract, the heart starts out as a tube. So this tube turns into the adult heart. And so superiorly, you have the aortic arches and the bulbo, bulbous cordis, which will later divide into the truncus arteriosus and conus. So basically, these are structures that are going to form your pulmonary trunk and your aorta. You've got this primitive ventricle, which not surprisingly divides into a primitive right and primitive left ventricle in complete communication with each other at this stage. Then you've got your AV canal, and then you've got your atrium and sinus venosus. And the sinus venosus will turn into your SVC and IVC. So straight away you see something's going wrong here. We've got the atrium down the bottom. We've got to get the atrium up to the top. And so that's what will happen. And it'll start to bend. It's called de-looping and it'll start to, to turn. And then it'll keep on turning. And eventually what you want to try and do is get to this stage where you have this upward movement of the atria and the sinus venosus so that your primitive atria are on the dorsal side of the ventricle. So they're going to be superior to the ventricles. That's obvious. But... They're also posterior, and that's where it comes from. When the heart's in the anatomical position, you see that left atrium is that true posterior structure, and it comes from this positioning. Now, when you look here, you say, well, we're almost there to what an adult heart would look like, except this AV canal. We've got to get a tricuspid valve over here. We've got to get a mitral valve over here. We've got to get a connection between the right and left atrium to the respective <laughs> ventricles, and we have to turn this into two trunks, and they have to get onto the right side of the... Or the right ventricle and then the, and then the left ventricle. So we'll speak about this more at the next symposium to do with the aorta, but uniquely the, the conotruncus will actually divide, so it will actually form two parallel chambers. So what I'm talking about is this structure here, which is truncus arteriosus and the conus. It will actually divide to form two, ch two parallel uh, chambers, and on the right the chamber becomes the aorta. So we go back to that first picture, the aorta is to the right of the pulmonary trunk. And then you see that you, the, on the other side, you have your um, pulmonary artery. Now, that's in the right position. So aorta on the right, pulmonary trunk on the left. But remember, the pulmonary trunk's got to be anterior to the aorta. So what happens is there's this twist. There's this clockwise rotation. And that gets it in the right position. Now, what happens at the same time that it does this clockwise rotation the conus will resorb. But it doesn't do so equally between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. The conus resorbs more below the aortic valve, and it only resorbs a little bit on, in the right ventricle. So that's a feature then of the right ventricle. The right ventricle has an infundibulum. It's because the conus didn't resorb as much as it did in the left ventricle. So I think sometimes you'll come across and you'll be asked the question, hey, what makes a right ventricle a right ventricle? And we'll say things like, well, you know, the right ventricles, usually in normal people, it's a bit, it's thinner. It's got more trabeculations. But really what you want to say is it's got the most apically displaced valve, the tricuspid valve. But the other answer, which is correct, is that it has an infundibulum. And that comes from these embryolo embryological origins to do with the conus and its difference in resorption between the right ventricle and the left 
Now, consequence of the conus being resorbed more in the left ventricle is that you have continuity between the mitral valve and the aortic valve. And that's the reason why you'll have uh, the right fibrous trigone um, merging sort of with the, the membranous septum forming this central tendon. And then you have your left fibrous trigone, and the surgeons will talk about then the aortic mitral wind, uh, curtain, which is the bit in between. But the only reason that you have that continuity is because of the difference in resorption of the conus. And so when you actually then look at the left ventricle and you look at this specimen, which is akin to sort of your parasternal long axis view on echo, you'll see that there's an overlap between the outlet and the inlet, between your aorta and the mitral valve. And that, only become, that is only apparent because of this continuity, which is only apparent because of the difference in the conus resorption. And that's why you can have things like SAM, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, because that anterior, that anterior part of the mitral valve is going to be flung across into the outlet because of that continuity. Other features of the left ventricle is that the apical portion does contain trabeculations, and we'll look at the embryological origins in a second. Of course, it can be a lot more prominent in some people, but there is sort of this tend to overcall these apical trabeculations, we all have it. And if you look at specimens from normal individuals, you do see it. And I think with the advent with MRI, we're seeing it more prominently. Whether it's going to be pathological or not, I think time will tell with some of the studies that are going on. The other thing you'll notice is left ventricle approximates a cone, and that's why we can do things like Simpson's rule and we can get volumes and things on echo. But the right ventricle, I always like to think of it, it hugs the left ventricle. And so that's why it's actually quite difficult on echo to get good measurements. And I know we're getting better with it, but to get good measurements and volumes of the right ventricle, because the anatomy is just different and it just hugs it. And because it hugs it, that's why you get a curved septal component of the left ventricle. So we're all used to seeing this, this curved part of the LV septum. And we're also probably used to seeing that people over the age of 60, 70, 80 years old that angulation at the base can increase. And we sometimes make the comment on an echo report, S-shaped septum, and sometimes you can get some flow acceleration through it. And it comes from the relationship between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. The other thing that may not be well known is that if you, if you traverse the LV septum from base to apex, it does actually change in thickness in normal people. So, you know, we know up to 14 millimetres at the base and when it starts going up to 18, 20, we you know, think about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but don't under underestimate what the, me the measurements you make towards the apex, because in a normal apex, it should actually thin down, sort of get down to sort of five millimetres. So if you're measuring 10 or 11 or 12 there at the apex, that's abnormal. So about that septum, how did we, how did we get there? So remember, when we got to this primitive view of the heart, we've got a right ventricle and a left ventricle, but they're in complete communication with each other. So what actually happens is in the adult septum over here, you've the ventricular septum, so this is viewing somebody in a um, sagittal section, so they're standing side on and you're cutting slices through them and you're looking at the LV from the LV, the, the septum from the LV side. You'll see that there's this muscular ventricular septum. There's, um, and really there's also this um, membranous part and then there's the vestige of the conus, so the remnant of the conus. So we really divide this adult ventricular septum into an intrinsic outlet and membranous part. And by far the intrinsic part is you know, developed from the muscular septum and that makes up most of it. And when there's a defect in this septation, that's where you can get a VSD, which is a muscular VSD. The outlet part develops from the conus, but it's only very small because the conus was largely resorbed. This membranous part is the most complex and it's the last to close in the ventricular septum because it actually has, is composed of the muscular septum, there's bits of the conus, and there's parts of the endocardial cushions which were designed to form your valves, your tricuspid and mitral valves, but it also will help form this membranous part of the septum. And of course, you can get a membranous VSD and this is the last part to close. So by far, the muscular septum is, is the biggest part and the way that it gets from this to this is that it keeps on sinking and absorbing, sinking and absorbing, and that's how you then get these trabeculations forming. And depending on how it resorbed and sunk, that determines how much trabeculation somebody has, uh, particularly at their apex.
but also in this part of the septum. So when we think about that, we can see that the endocardial aspect is characterised by these um, you know, trabeculations. So you can see all these trabeculations here. And I draw your attention also to um, the apex and how thin it can actually get to, just as we were saying, sort of that five millimetres or less sometimes. Sometimes you can have these muscular strands, so-called false tendons that we'll call on echo, um, and you'll see that they actually extend from the septum to the papillary muscles, and that's what a false tendon is. <laughs> Analogous, you know, sort of to the moderator band that you can see with the RV, but you do get these um, prominent muscular strands. And then you can see also how the outlet portion um, of the septum this sort of, is, is relatively smooth um, compared to the rest. And you can also see that you can get these quite thick muscular bundles. Um, so they can sometimes give the appearance of sort of increased trabeculation. But it's just the way that it forms embryologically. And there's quite a bit of variation between people. And what about then the papillary muscles? Well, we term the papillary muscles as posterior medial and anterolateral. But anatomically, when you actually look in the anatomic position of the LV, the correct terminology would be posterior superior muscle and anterior inferior muscle because you can clearly see that this papillary muscle is superior to this and that this muscle is slightly more anterior to this one. So those are the correct anatomical terms, but we'll use PM and AL um, from here on. So the, these papillary muscles are located in the mid to apical segments of the left ventricle. And you'll probably see, and mainly also on MRI and your short axis stacks when you have a look through there, you'll see that there's a bit of variation with the papillary muscle, mainly in this posterior medial papillary muscle. It can have two or three heads, and in myxomatous disease, you can often see that, and they can be calcified. And that may actually then lead to disruption um, with the chordae tendinae and then give you mitral regurgitation as well. And the positions of the papillary muscles in, uh, ensure that the cords arising from the papillary muscles go to both leaflets. So there's a misconception sometimes people think, well, the posterior superior muscle supplies, you know, certain, only this part of the, the, the posterior part of the, the valve, and some people think it only supplies the anterior. But, you know, we're designed in such a way so that your chordae tendinae from each papillary muscle will go to both the anterior and posterior leaflets and to all of the scallops. So what about if you look at muscle bundles and planes, and if you actually did a dissection through the heart in layers, it turns out that we actually have three types of layers in the heart if you were to do a dissection from epicardium to endocardium. So there is a superficial layer of muscular strands, and that's really sub-epicardial. Then you've got this middle layer, and then you have a sub-endocardial layer. So that's why it's superficial through to deep. And it represents changes in orientation of these strands transmurally, meaning they're all in a crisscross three-dimensional way. And that's why when you take sections of a heart and look at it histologically, you can get really nice sections where you've cut end on with the striations and you get these nice striations. And other times you're, you've cut on face of the cardiomyocyte and you don't see that. And that's because these layers are interwoven. But if you do the section, you can see that you will have these three layers. And there's the superficial layer, as you can see, it extends across both ventricles, goes all the way across, and it comprises about 25% of your wall thickness. The middle layer is really more circumferential and hugs each ventricle, and that really comprises, you know, 55, 60% of the wall thickness. And interestingly, the older we get, the more this layer thickens and may contribute to, you know, some of the diastolic dysfunction um, and physiological diastolic profiles that we see with ageing. And then finally you have your deep layers, which you can see there's a clear difference in that they're longitudinally arranged. And these layers will actually fuse and be continuous with the papillary muscles. So when we look at some pathology here, you can see in this heart, which is a dilated cardiomyopathy, you can see that the bases of the papillary muscles are actually continuous with the trabeculations. And then this is obvious here. You've got a very hypertrophied heart. This is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a variant form where there's actually concentric hypertrophy as opposed to the traditional septal hypertrophy, which happens in about 80% of cases. 
um, this is a minority, but you can see then what happens to the cavity size and it completely obliterates in the, with the LV. So what about then the micro architecture? What about the histology? Because that's also important uh, when we talk about anatomy. And these are some bright field uh, slides taken by one of the students in my research laboratory. And you can see in a normal heart, a very young normal heart, and then also in an older adult uh, but normal heart. There's a nice sort of picture of the cardiomyocytes with striations, with intercalated discs, uh, nuclei that are centrally orientated, nice communication between them. But then you see what happens with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You've still got the mass of cardiomyocytes there, but the cardiomyocytes themselves, the morphology has changed. They're hypertrophied. There's disarray between their communication. It's not surprising then why people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can get ventricular arrhythmias and be prone to sudden cardiac death because there is this disarray of the cardiomyocytes. And then compare that to, say, a dilated cardiomyopathy. This is a non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, so it's someone who is likely has a genetic mutation in, in Titan. And here, there's less cardiomyocytes, but they still look hypertrophied and globular, and there's this replacement fibrosis here as well. And even the nuclei look a bit strange. They're sort of globular in structure. So we as clinicians and, and medical people, when we think about hearts and we think about those gross specimens that I showed you, we say, well, there's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where it's all thick, and then there's dilated cardiomyopathy where it's dilated. But if you actually section both of those hearts and looked under the microscope, what you see are hypertrophied cardiomyocytes. So that means it's an unhealthy cardiomyocyte. So yes, you lose cardiomyocytes in heart failure, um, but when you actually look at the ones that remain, they're hypertrophy. Whether the pathology or the phenotype is really HCM or if it's DCM, they still look globular and hypertrophy. And just to sort of compare the obvious thing with an ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy when you take a sample of the LV, hardly any cardiomyocytes are left. Lots of fibrosis. The cardiomyocytes that are left look abnormal. So no wonder why you can get VT in a, with, with a heart like this. And just to prove it, you know, really, when we talk about left ventricular systolic failure, we're talking about a loss of cardiomyocytes. If you actually looked at the density of cardiomyocytes going through those specimens, then you can clearly see that you know, there's this graded uh, decrease in the number of cardiomyocytes. With HCM, you know, really retaining quite a bit of the cardiomyocytes, but they're just abnormal. And then you actually lose with fibrosis. Okay, well, we've actually come to the last slide, so that's it. So good timing. It is. Believe me, see? There wasn't no other slide left. All right, thank you.